with the sweater. So here it is. Yay. Um, okay. So we should start with a little bit of an introduction, I guess. Uh, so uh, Jeremy, I'm going to send it over so you can introduce a little bit about yourself, who you are, and why are you here? Cool. Thanks, JP. Uh, so my name's Jeremy or Jer, uh, like share and bear, trying a new thing out. We'll see how long it sticks. Um, I use any pronouns. I'm at the School of Theology at Boston University, and I'm doing my, I just finished my first of two semesters of my Master's of Sacred Theology. So exciting. And as I know, everyone here has some uh, relief around this time of year. I can feel that and also extra stress. We're all over the place, complicated. And we, I had this wild idea to do a video event that uh, JP, you fabulously hosted last time, the Queer Art of Reading and Resilience. And then BU gave us more money. Um, yeah, thanks BU. So the Build Innovation Lab, um, we, they chose us to be a seed grant winner, which gave us $500 to start off and put us on the innovation pathway. And we can reach like at least $3,000, if not more. So we're on our way to hopefully becoming a, a nonprofit in the future, Stories of Survival. And the Queer Art of Resilience will be a product child avenue of, um, doing our mission of uplifting queer survivors and queer trans non-binary people, uh, particularly of color to talk about the world and to talk about, I mean, you know, everything from their perspectives that are beautiful and unique. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Jer. I love that. Uh, just like Chair, I think that that is a great way of introducing yourself and I would 100% co-sign that. Uh, my name is Just JP. Uh, I am a drag performer um, in Boston, Massachusetts, born and raised in El Salvador. And I've been doing drag for about four years and um, I'm almost done with my face. I'm on drag time, so I'm just gonna keep doing my makeup while we are in um, this meeting. Um, hopefully I finish it by the time we're done. Um, and you can follow me on all of my social medias. It's at Drag Queen JP. I'm a drag queen, my name is JP. That's the easiest thing for you to remember. And um, we are so excited uh, to be in conversation tonight with the one and only Jack Bruno. Jack uh, uses he pronouns. And I would like uh, to pass it on to you so you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Jack, go for it. Thank you, JP. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Jack Bruno. Um, as JP said, I use he, him pronouns. I am um, by day the operations coordinator for the Division of Education and Training. Um, by night, I moonlight as someone who talks to people on the internet um, in this debut performance. Uh, but really, I am a um, transmasculine, white, and indigenous person. I'm a member of the citizen band Potawatomi tribe in um, my tribe's language. Uh, we're known as the Bodewadmi. Um, and I live in Somerville, Mass, with my partner and our cats called the Spice Boys. Um, I love crafting and reading tarot on a like baby's first professional side hustle um, level. Uh, I do a little bit of consulting um, as well on like diversity and equity and inclusion things. Um, Jer and I were comparing tarot decks um, before uh, other folks jumped on the call. So it's definitely a love of mine. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to, to chat with everybody. Yay! Thank you so much uh, for sharing that and thank you so much for uh, being here with us today. Um, I, uh, I'm really excited, so we'll just jump right in. Um, uh, Jer, uh, Jer and I, Jer, like share, yes. Jer and I um, will be um, taking turns into asking questions. However, I want to invite all of y'all uh, to put your questions um, down in uh, the chat. And uh, Jared and I will do our best to incorporate it um, as we go along. 
And uh, we want to get started by, um, well, acknowledging that we are talking all about uh, resilience today. Uh, is the queer art of resilience, right? And um, we are going to be uh, touching a lot of topics um, around family, um, growing up, coming out, um, identity. Um, so uh, this space is, um, um, or like there may be things during um, our conversation that may be triggering. And of course, we don't know everybody's triggers. So please take care of yourself. Um, if you are a survivor of partner abuse uh, in our LGBTQ and RT communities, uh, the network Lared has a 24 seven hotline um, that is 800-832-1901. And somebody is there if you need support. Um, and uh, having said all that, we are going to start with the very first question. Uh, Jack, what is uh, your personal definition of resilience? Uh, sure. So um, kind of a love-hate relationship with the term resilience and the way that it's utilized in different spaces. Um, I think it's really complicated. Uh, so, you know, we think of resilience in its basic form as like the ability to bounce back right after adversity or trauma um, and also the like state of elasticity or like ability to weather change. Um, <clears throat> and I think that like on a surface level that that's a definition that is a def a dictionary definition. Um, but I think that you really have to look at the nuances of the application of the term in different spaces and like who's using it for whom um, and to what end. Uh, and also I think it's important to question the um, idea of linear healing um, and resilience. If, you know, I, I think that it like, for me, healing isn't linear, um, recovery isn't linear. And so the idea of bouncing back from a moment, this assumption that um, maybe not assumption, but kind of like encoded idea in the framework that like the thing is discrete, like the activity is discrete, the trauma is discrete, and that you're able to bounce back of, back from it and be in that like state pre-trauma, pre-adversity. Um, and that doesn't really, that doesn't work for me as much because they're, in my experience and my experiences of adversity, my experiences of trauma, there's something alchemical there. Um, there's something, I don't think that'll resonate with everyone that something has changed or slipped or been modified by those experiences, but that's been the case for me. You know, even if it might appear, if we're thinking about um, healing and recovery being kind of a slinky shape, right? If we're not talking, it's like linear, but it's the cyclical progression. Um, then it might look like you've come to the same place. Like if we track the one point on the slinky and then move up linearly, it can look linear, right? But it's, it's not experientially for me. Um, people are missing that journey, missing the other aspects of it. Um, and so that's like scratching the surface of um, me as I've been wrestling with this idea of resilience. And shout out to Andrew, uh, not Andrew, I see your face there. Shout out to Amber, who's in this, who actually started my journey in wrestling with the complexities of resiliency and pushing back really on how it's utilized um, in spaces. Because I think that just reading around and looking at how that word is being used in different spaces, you know, if someone in your workplace is um, responding that you need to be more resilient, right? We're kind of like turning that into a moral hyper-individualistic characteristic and not something that actually has roots in the idea of healing um, and carrying on through adversity and trauma. And so if it's like, if your resiliency is being utilized to determine whether or not you're able to be a productive component of a system that's not necessarily built to help you enact your own healing or do that within community, then resilience is being weaponized um, and put to work by structures that just don't really care that you're healing or don't really care that 
you're growing, but just care that you're functional. And what then what does functionality mean? Um, and what does it mean to then pathologize folks that are symptomatic or aren't able to really like fit the hegemonic idea of what resiliency looks like and what does healing look like and what does wellness look like? So I think it gets into a lot, it touches on so many different aspects. And I think that it's dangerous to look at resiliency as a buzzword, especially in 2020, you know, especially when I think so many folks across the board, maybe folks who hadn't experienced it before are facing ongoing adversity. Um, and also to tie that into um, people don't heal or grow or like move through experiences in a vacuum. And so what resources, what additional structures of support, what additional um, places to rest did people have to get them to a place that other folks can recognize as resilient? And what's the scale, I guess, like temp what's the temporal window at where we're gauging someone's resiliency? Are they resilient a week after a traumatic incident? Are they resilient six months out of getting out of something that was more of like a chronic stressor? Are they 10 years out? Is the person who doesn't experience say PTSD after an acute incidence of trauma, are they more or less resilient than someone who was system symptomatic for 10 years and is now experiencing greater healing, greater growth and great, greater, what we would say resiliency, you know? So I think it's all a moving target. <laughs> Long story short, it's complicated. Totally. <laughs> I hope um, that was at all coherent. <laughs> One thing that um, really resonated is um, the commodifying of resilience mm -hmm. and how um, we can uh, be putting those um, uh, goalposts and that um, we say like, oh, somebody is, um, somebody isn't there yet. So we can't, uh, you know, I, I see this a lot in terms of like receiving services in uh, many organizations that they require somebody to be at a certain point. And mm -hmm. while that could make sense in terms of, you know, organizationally, um, if the organization isn't reaching, meeting people where they're at, then, you know, is that even a good resource? Um, so that really um, connected with me. Um, one, um, uh, I would, um, I'm actually going to throw it out to, uh, Jer, um, if you would like to add either a follow-up or if you would like to ask the next question. Thanks. Just JP and Jack. I agree. I think that, I mean, resiliency is so complex. Like what is that word even? Um, except everything that you just said <laughs> and so much it's it one thing that I'm really starting to find um like in delving into trauma research and also like historical um maybe not even it was called trauma research then but like critical race theory um is I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois talks about needing that community to be able to foster thoughts and um, to go through. I mean, it's, you can't expect someone to run a race when they have been hampered for so long and crippled for so long to, for back, lack of a better term, um, to, to get to those markers that you're talking about, JP. Um, and I think my high horse is substance use because mm. I am a recovering alcoholic um, and I'm over 200 and I think I'm 212 days sober today after 15 years plus. And accessing services for a lot of times means being sober and that wasn't something I was able to do. Mm -hmm. um, so spot on. And yes, um, let's, I think, move on to the next question. If 
everyone oh jack response yes right response in. um uh sorry a really important other piece that i wanted to kind of was like put out into the conversation is that i think that while it can be really i think empowering to name the like resilient strategies that you've utilized to like get through what you got through um that conversation i think on a cultural scale can shift the focus onto lionizing people who have gone through what they went through rather than interrogating the structures that created adversity right we know that like some adversity is just things that people will experience as humans you know the death of loved ones etc um but some are very specifically rooted in oppression and like systemic stuff that needs to be interrogated and pushed against so having the conversation around like resilience built through systemic oppression is not the the like goal there isn't then to like historicize people have survived a system that needs to be changed and shifted so i think that like there's a kind of a romanticizing element of like the strength of oppressed people to like get through what they got through without questioning or wanting to disrupt the things that they experienced because of structures of inequality. So that's my, other, that's my other thing. I just think that it's important to name that too. Thank you. I'm so glad that you named that because that's, it's so true. It's a very slippery slope where what is survival for someone can become like, I mean, we commodify it into how can we profit off of someone's survival and so that's why we have like alcohol marketed towards people at pride i mean they're the biggest sponsors <laughs> there's a reason because that's tools that have been used to oppress not just mm -hmm. even queer people or trans people or non-binary people but everyone mm -hmm. with an underserved population alcohol has right. been a weapon um, and other substances just, I mean, trail along in that path of like seeking oblivion right. sometimes. <laughs> right. Or having, and having those experiences co-opted in order to be someone else's inspiration porn that then is weaponized against your own community mm -hmm. and having that be like, well, look how resilient they are. You know, it's the, it's like the emotional bootstraps. So mm -hmm. I just like, exactly. um, Right. And really, like, nobody should be, um, nobody should be uh, telling, you know, you're, res you're resilient or you're not, other than that person, mm -hmm. you know, like, resiliency mm -hmm. is not right. really something that uh, can be measured um, from the outside mm -hmm. um, many times, because we don't know all of the things that are going on in someone's life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, totally. And did people get by for reasons that aren't characterized under resiliency as we've have it, have it defined you know the ability to like be optimistic and all those things that I think that you have kind of a corporate like training around resiliency what if they got through just in spite of it all like to spite it all what if anger was the driving factor what if you know like you know whatever motivating thing got you through that situation may not fall under the neat umbrella of you know these like psychological characteristical traits you know i know that there are times that like i survived to spite people and like not individuals but just like systems that wanted me dead mm -hmm. and so you know what what then what if it's like i you know rage carried me through in some places and that's not pretty it's not that's not teachable in a boardroom mm -hmm. um totally I'm in areas in case it isn't apparent. <laughs> um, I want to um, uh, break a little bit from uh, the scheduled questions and read a comment, um, if that's OK. Um, uh, say, I'm hoping that I'm saying it. Like the letter K. K, K. Mm -hmm. there you go. Thank you. Uh, K uh, mentioned that, um, have you encountered any challenges where you are more resilient than is expected? And what happened, if so? Um, Kay, is it okay if I read your example? Thank you. Um, for example, following a traumatic event in my life, I didn't experience the challenges people thought I should because I was not exhibiting the appropriate level of distress. 
resilience uh, was not attributed to me. And the assumption was that I was either lying or somehow exhibiting another pathology. I uh, have had many people tell me uh, which of my experiences should be the most upsetting rather than letting me define that based on my actual experience. Um, thank you. So I'm going to repeat the question that you asked at the beginning. Um, have you encountered any challenges where you are more resilient than is expected? And what happened if so? Yeah, Kay, thank you. Um, Kay is like such a thoughtful, incredible person. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Um, but I think that like you, you nailed it there. You named it, like not being able to define your actual experience. It's like how, you know, people can't tell folks how to grieve. There's no one standard way to grieve someone or something. And I think that um, reactions to trauma, react reactions to adversity, I think are, are the same. There's no universal way because your body is going to process it differently. Your mind, your soul, your heart, everything's going to process it differently. And folks can only rank those or weigh in on where they think they should be on some appropriate like trauma reaction scale based on their own pos positionality, you know, especially if they like have an experience that trauma or something parallel, right? They're only really approximating what they might display. And it's not even necessarily about you know, like your in, internal landscape and reacting to that, it's your expression of that. And so I think so many things shape our understanding of what appropriate expression is. I mean, like cultural differences, gender differences, like there's so much to that. Um, so don't let nobody like define your experience for you, A. Um, but I think for me, it's been, things don't feel for me like, resilient in the moment. Like it feels kind of awful. It feels rough in the moment. It feels, this isn't something that I want to be experiencing. It's not, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to get through this and, <laughs> um, and it's going to make me, it's going to build my character. It's like, no, this is shitty. And I wish it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, like I would, I would, it's only after the fact for me, it's only retro retroactive that I'm able to be like, Hey, I grew through this. Some of it's scar tissue and some of it is the ability to like give way in ways that I wasn't capable of before. Cause I think resiliency gets coded as toughness and grit and the ability to just power through and that's such like <laughs> a single story thing right and so coded in terms of what values are in that mm -hmm. you know like gendered assumptions around you know individualism and individual ruggedness and all of those things that for me don't resonate culturally I'm a very soft boy <laughs> and some of that like resilience has been the ability to remain soft or like soften afterwards you know so it's like I can be a shell I can ignore my body through chronic stressors through acute traumas and it's only the strength of weirdly masculinized right like um if you're not Daniel Boone are you really resilient um uh, but like the strength of softening, right? The strength of being vulnerable and um, emotionally malleable to yourself. Um, and so I think that like that, I think about that is only really being able to like put it in a framework <laughs> um, after the fact, you know, like um, for instance, like when I was a kid, we had, um, sustained food insecurity um, related to poverty and access. Um, and we also had uh, structural things that um, were expected for us to have that we just didn't. Um, you know, the things, that, the things that go first when you gotta pay rent um, and everything else needs to take a back seat. Um, so heat being turned off, water being turned off for a long time, we didn't have a vehicle in Phoenix, which is, a, is not a city like Boston where you can like viably get around using public transportation to a <laughs> greater or lesser extent, um, you know? And so as kids, as an elementary school student, I was getting up at 3 a.m. with my family to walk um, almost five miles and two buses to get to school because we needed to go to the same school that my mom worked at. And the only place my mom got a job was uh, two towns away. Um, that didn't, that wasn't a story that my teachers were ready to hear. Um, there wasn't, that wasn't a context that they like understood their kids coming into their classroom with. 
And so when I, I am not an athletic kid, I'll say that straight out. But when like me running a mile in the Phoenix heat after like food insecurity, walking five miles before dawn um, and like feeling like I was going to pass out and just be done with my, my life. It's just dead, like done then um, that, that hits different, you know, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And um, just those invisible, invisible, like, things that people are carrying day to day um, that are aspects of, if we can think of like a more holistic term than resilience, um, just that get by, you know, like what was done, what did you do to get by? Not because like it was this grand act of like resilience, but was the daily things that you didn't have a choice on. You know, we, if you don't have a choice, then it's just what you like have to do. And there were definite moments as a kid, as a fifth grader, I wanted to lay down face down on the sidewalk and like not move again to just literally give up because it was just this endless expectation that this was what my life was. Um, and as a kid with like depression for as long as I have been a person with like awareness um, that sense stuck with me and it's only after the fact that I'm like a five-year like a fifth grader did that and to be able to kind of like honor that but in the moment it doesn't feel honorable it feels grinding to the bone um it doesn't feel heroic you know and so like other folks looking in on your life and trying to say like this is what that experience should mean to you and this is how you should be embodying it nah (laughs) <laughs> they can like stay in their own lane um, because they're carrying something too, likely, you know, um, like some pain, some injury um, of whatever scale they have experienced it. Um, and I think they also want to be able to own that experience. And so having folks set boundaries about you don't get to define this for me, or you don't get to tell me like how my body should be processing and and moving through this. I think also it's a mirror put up to reflect that back to them that, and it's your job (laughs) to experience and name um, and carry yours too. And I'm here to help you carry. I'm here to like (laughs) encourage you on and keep you moving, but, um, but you don't get to tell me how much I'm carrying. Sorry, (laughs) preaching. Um, but I guess that's what y'all are here for. So, uh, totally. Thank you. I am thinking a lot, as everyone is, I'm sure, um, about. Th- I mean, all of this, and I think one thing this I and uh, Kai. Hey. Hey. All right, mm-hmm. we're gonna get there by the end of the night. Thank you. Okay, um, highlighted it, the invisible things we carry. And it's interesting because it, I think what I am hearing is that we're sometimes, I mean, really the only way, and this isn't even a very accurate way of knowing someone else's experiences of trauma is to have those own experiences and to kind of be able to see to some extent those invisible things that we carry. Mm. Um, and it sounds like, I mean, you're saying I'm, I'm not here to carry your things, but I, you, I can see that you have them also. Mm. And something about my experience um, as Jack has given me the ability to see what you can't see and let me mm. help you. I mean, a very, I mean, if we're looking at religion, like very Christ-like being able to see, I mean, the blind, see to, to heal and to see and um, to do so from like a wounded standpoint. Mm. I think that that's true. I think that it like experiences of trauma can create that empathic lens, but I think that it takes a lot of 
self-reflection and self-awareness and self-knowledge to understand how your lens might be warped because of those same experiences. So I, I don't think, I don't think experiencing trauma makes you across the board, like unilaterally a, a better person. I think that that's a really important narrative to push back on um, because experiencing trauma means that you experience trauma and that that's it, you know, but like the places you go from that, the ways that it does or doesn't change you, the ways that it does or doesn't change your relationships with yourself and other people, that's all the complexity, right? That's human variation. Um, there may be some observable patterns, but um, having that like empathic lens, it also can go the other way, right? Like we can get sharp too. Um, and I've, I've felt that myself where even in a moment, if I can see someone else's suffering or see someone else's like trauma reaction, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm any more or less capable of connecting with them. Um, that's something to work on too, you know, because like the protective spiky coating um, can get in the way sometimes, right? I think that it's really important to know um, we talked about, you know, triggers and like knowing those about yourself. We have to hold those and honor our boundaries around what our trigger responses are, what are places where we no longer really feel um, safe or receptive to hearing things are. And that's a lot of, a lot of self-knowledge and a lot of self-awareness, because even if I can see your pain and it like resonates with me, um, that reson that resonance might be um connecting right we might be like vibing but <laughs> uh, through that shared experience but it might also just be pain so protecting yourself and honoring that potential connection but not leaning into it as something that's inevitably going to be good because it might not be right i mean i'm in the, my first year of, uh, of social work school so i'm obviously trying to like leverage that um that like empathy and wanting to show up for and with people um, and like witness and facilitate people's self, self growth and like involvement and, and healing. Um, but I think it's, um, I don't, I don't want to be unkind. So it's not naive, it's not misled, but it's missing the whole view to just say, because I hurt, I understand you're hurt too. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a helpful dynamic. I think you have to make it intentionally a helpful dynamic. Otherwise, I think that there's a lot of pain that can happen in either direction, so. Yeah, and that um, it's not, we're not there um, at any given moment. Um, as you were saying about your uh, experiences growing up and having to get up at 3 a.m. Uh, and walk five miles, um, I will never claim to be able to understand that, right? um because it's not my experience however mm -hmm. I can what I can do is I can empathize and yeah. I can um try to put myself in your shoes and the last thing that I would want uh is for anyone to say oh well I had it worse right yeah. um or do like the Olympics of like oh right. you had to get up at three well I had to get up at 2 30. <laughs> I'm like well yeah. not good for you but you know what I mean yeah yeah, and I think that like, there's, I hope to a place to get, get to a place where like, like empathy isn't, I mean, we can talk about compassion fatigue, but like empathy and honoring each other's experiences isn't a limited resource, you know, there's like, we don't have to play the like trauma Olympics because um, we can, you know, we can work to like see and witness and like, hold that and hold space for that. Um, because I think that like having, being seen for those experiences, um, like that's just my life. It does, you know, like the things, the trauma, the adversities, whatever, that's just life. And so many people are also carrying that. I think validating it without being, without it being competitive, without it having to like race to the worst experience. Um, lets you like just sit with that and be like yes you had sorry I lost myself a little bit um something I think just empathy not being like a limited resource you know we can all sit with this together and we don't have to have the exact same experiences in order to 
to be in community or be in a healing space with each other. Right. And knowing that there will, it will take time for many of us to recognize that we had to be resilient um, because mm -hmm. there are many things that happen in our lives that it, it just happens and we have to deal with them. And um, it's uh, not only is it after some time has passed in which we're able to reflect back and say like, wow, that was shitty, that was hard. And wow, I got through that. So again, like it's, um, um, it is nobody else's um, position to talk about um, our history of resilience. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanna say once more, thank you to everybody uh, who's okay. here. And I am seeing a lot of things uh, in the comments, uh, in the chat. Um, and for people who are watching this on the rewatch, if there's a rewatch, thank you for staying with <laughs> us. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Jer actually just uh, share something in, in the chat. Um, would you mind uh, sharing this with us? Go for it. Sure. I was, um, you know, I was just asking, it, it, this came to mind while you were sharing, um, can trauma and resilience, as we're sort of dissecting the, the words, can they ever be considered tools to use in overcoming identity politics and mm -hmm. coming together as a collective for some sort of greater equity and transformation? Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how the really the civil rights movement and queer liberation are, are so deeply intertwined mm -hmm. and that there was a recognition of that um, for people who were important and who were, I mean, like Bayard Rustin mm -hmm. saw the, the importance of being a black gay man and that those two identities among many identities were inherent to his being and needed to be expressed in order for him mm -hmm. to truly live. Um, and that, I mean, he was huge for, um, for the civil rights movement. And, and so I wonder what kind of for everyone, but especially in this convo, what y'all think. Well, Jack, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think this is a really great question. And I think that um, it seems like a useful strategy right for like collective engagement because I think if we're able to like hold an honor that um I experienced xyz and here I'm thinking like not like so specifically about the like systemic adversities um linked and traumas linked to systems of oppression but I think that we can talk about it as like the human traumas and adversities as well um, but I think if we can sit and hold each other's experiences of adversity um, and trauma collectively, sorry, this is just relying on the words, um, but if we can link those back to the need for systemic change, I think that that's really important and to honor, especially the folks that live at the intersections of like marginalized and oppressed identities. Um, you know, if we're like, you know, I'm a trans masculine person, I, I'm usually coded as white. I'm an indigenous person. And so for me, like my work, especially as I've been thinking about my um, social work career and my time um, at Simmons, is thinking about how I have um, this draw to work with other trans and gender diverse people in my community, and then needing to take a step back and uh, interrogating, questioning, and thinking through what that means. What does my community look like? And recognizing that a lot of the TGD spaces that I interact with are still white predominantly. And we know that um, disparities faced by TGD BIPOC are like significantly higher even than white TGD folks that mm -hmm. whiteness still has, um, is still a protective factor um, in naming people's experiences and likelihood, likelihoods of experience, specifically um, racialized uh, gendered violence. Um, and so how do we center the experiences of 
um, individuals who are st statistically and significantly more likely to be carrying ongoing trauma and be facing the kind of chronic stresses that we know um, occur under systems of oppression. And so I think that there's kind of this like molecule model of um, centering the folks that are carrying disproportionate amounts of trauma and then the electrons of people who are working through that as well, right? And like um, thinking about, okay, so I'm like, I, I do a lot of thinking about like physics and how that can be used as um, metaphors in thinking through things like intersectionality. Uh, Steph, who is on the line, has heard me talk about my prism understanding of intersectionality before, but um, if we're thinking molecularly or atomically, like, you know, the electrons are jumping fields based on their energy level or their charge at any given point and they're cycling, right? Like, and ions happen when you have an, um, an atom that takes on a negative or a positive charge. Anyway, um, the point being that like, it's a structure where people, where elements are moving based on energy flow and moving based on like what the individual electron has to give or take and it's centered around the nucleus. So if we're like thinking about, um, working collectively for equity and transformation, like what little like charge are we bringing to the center and then falling back when we need to take care of ourselves and how are we stepping forward and moving back, um, keeping that like nucleus um, mm -hmm. at the center and um, neutral, right? And neutral, I mean like, <laughs> um, how can we create protective factors when like systemic oppression denies those from for the people at the center. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for humoring my metaphor. Um, so yeah, I think that resisting the urge to um, play oppression or trauma Olympics um, and understanding that we're not facing these things, like to push back against the hyper individuality of experience and think about collective trauma, think about cultural trauma um, and how the things that we experienced, right, and the narrative of resilience that we've carried with us can be like alchemized, transmogrified into resistance and wanting to say like, no, other people don't get to experience the, the chronic adversity that I did mm -hmm. if it's something that is um, able to be pushed back on. You know, it's the, it's the like, I wanna remove the barriers in the next person's way. I'm gonna clear the path as much as I can as I go. Um, you know, yeah. like how do we make it, how do we make it less hard for each other and making sure that like we're, we can keep walking too. Like how can we walk together knowing that we all have to go, you know? Yeah, um, it, it, it doesn't make sense personally to me um, when I hear folks, um, who are our elders and our different identities say, well, you have to go through this because I did. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that it's, um, I think that it's, uh, I think that it's unfair um, to have, uh, to not challenge those systems if we have the opportunity to challenge those systems. Right. Um, because folks are going to have their own experiences and they're going to have their own hardships. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to have the same hardships as one did. And, um, I, and I need, go for it. I'm so sorry. I just, I think it's so important what you're saying. And why, why is trauma a rite of passage? Mm -hmm. <laughs> for certain identities, why is trauma a rite of passage? Or something that is, just codified in being of that identity. Um, acknowledging the fact that, right, like a lot of us are carrying intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, JP, please finish your thought. I just wanted to like lift that up. No, totally. I mean, you're the one getting interviewed. Uh, I was <laughs> the one moving things along. So why is trauma a rite of passage? <sighs> um, yeah. It's um, because I think that we internalize that, right? As like communities, we internalize, you know, there was a question in the interview about coming out experiences. 
Um, mm-hmm. Sorry. Um, I like keep having a hiccup that's like almost there and it's just not. Um, and so the, I think that it, it, it becomes part of the, de- the definition of what it means to belong to XYZ. And um, therefore, if you don't experience a certain level of trauma or a certain acute trauma, then are you really of that location? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I can, I can speak from what it means to be like indigenous and a TGD person and a queer person is like, I feel like there's almost this, um, like for me, I, I've been grappling with this in the terms of a lot of the work in my day job, um, including talk conversations around TGD youth. And um, it is really great to see the like incredible um, stories that are coming out, out, coming from youth that we're working with and to see all of the like medical and social um, affirmations that um, people have access to that I didn't, you know, when I was like 11, 12, 13, 18, 20. Um, and um, I've had to really grapple with my own feelings of resistance and what is the word that I'm looking for? Um, Steph, we were talking about this the other day. Uh, of not resenting, you know, resenting that and grief. Yeah, thank you. Um, And resentment, right? So like, what does it mean to then resent people who share an identity with us who don't have a trauma experience and to do gatekeeping around? Well, that doesn't, that means you're not really X, Y, Z or you didn't have the actual experience, you know? Um, And so I think that there's, there's something there. Mm And, um, I, I guess um, it's important to bring this up that this is not just an, an individual mm-hmm. aspect. This also happens in uh, an organizational aspect. And I can think mm-hmm. of like many organizations that are led by people in our who have our identities, who are oppressed identities, um, that many of them, um, or like uh, many people within our systems are like, well, you have to go through the same struggles to like set up this um, systems that will, mm. you know, at, like the reason why there is the need to create those systems is because th- there is a need for support, right? Mm-hmm. So why are we reinventing the wheel, quote unquote, every single time that we need to build these systems to support us when mm-hmm. there are many you know, systems that have already been built. Um, and that's one thing that I um, talk with a couple of my friends about, why is there not a nonprofit that just teaches other folks how to do a nonprofit? You know, like why, why are we um, not filling in those gaps? Um, and um, yeah, and that thinking that it's a rite of passage, folks were saying in the chat how um, in academia, like the hazing and that, Mm. you know, there are many um, experiences that like folks need to go through. Um, But if those experiences are based on trauma, like I don't think people need to go through those experiences. Yeah. And to go back to the metaphor of the the path, it's like, it's not only like an opportunity for us to clear the path of obstacles, it's the ability to build an infrastructure so that people can, can, can follow. You know, if it's like, oh, but I cleared all the paths that I, all the obstacles that I experienced, doesn't mean anything for somebody who's experiencing, you know, who I didn't think, oh, like, oh, you mean you can't climb over that boulder? It's like, oh, you mean you, you encountered racism in the hiring process? Well, I didn't. So my, I cleared my path. I don't know about you, you know? So it's, it's, I think an ongoing, an ongoing work of like naming and holding the like adversity and the trauma that we carry not you know not like being put in a place where we have to forget those or have this kind of like amnesia about it um but also think about like our legacy too um so what do you what what is your inheritance around trauma and what is your legacy around trauma um and is there a way to um turn that towards healing um A hundred percent. Um, I I see a lot of things in the chat, but I also want to make space for Jer. How are you feeling? Um, how are you doing? Good. Yay! Awesome. Great. Um, 
Um, Steph, uh, share something, if that's okay, Steph, if I read it out loud. Thank you. Uh, I feel a significant part of the community relationships around unexpected level of trauma for an identity has at least some to do with previous generations not having enough time, support, et cetera, in grieving the opportunities they haven't had mm -hmm. and experiencing that resentment and envy for younger folks. Right. Totally. And it's so challenging to then approach that from a loving place you know, to approach like people who may be in more power than you do, than you have in the community or in an organization and like see that and still uh, like still work with positive regard, right? Or mm -hmm. coming from a loving place in that interaction is like, you sure are lashing out because of hurt, you know? Mm -hmm. In a professional setting or an academic setting when there's not, I mean, that's not really a, a feelings forward kind of a, an environment. And that can be avoided, you know, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to happen that way. And it's difficult to then also push back on those because there is this idea of like, well, you have to respect your elders, which absolutely you have, we have to respect everyone who's around us, right? Not just our elders, everyone. And um, I think that that expectation of like you can't um you can't challenge something without being disrespectful is something that we mm -hmm. definitely need to move past um because it is needed it is needed for us to be able to make um waves and be able to confront the things that we need to change we need to change yeah is it okay if i move us um to um, yeah, is it okay if we move us to another question that we had pre-prepared? Let's go for it. Awesome. Um, and I think that um, you have already touched on this uh, as most of the conversation that we've had uh, is around community. What, what role has art and community played in your life? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I am not much of an artiste in the capital A artist sense, um, but when I was thinking and reflecting on this question, one thing I will say is that um, moments of isolation are times when I have really relied on um, the art of others as a way of just not feeling so alone. Uh, the, the pressure and the stress of being the only blank in a room um, and not necessarily feeling like I had access to um, you know, maybe a pan tribal community, much less like community within my own tribal group, um, or, you know, being the only queer person in a room, the only trans person in a room, um, the only like person from like the South in a room, um, the only like working class poor person in a room, um, you know, all of those things that were just alienating in, uh, academia in, you know, um, the like private boarding school that I got a full ride scholarship to um, in college where even in a setting where I was able to do like critical race theory and native studies and queer studies, um, even in that context, still having to um, work within a colonial and colonizing system um, that was not built for me. Like anytime I've been interacting, which has been for the majority of my life because I'm a big old nerd and I like going to school. Um, anytime I've been isolated, right? I like pick up like Harjo and I, I read, you know, I like pick up Almanac of the Dead and I cry for three weeks. <laughs> um, you know, like I um, find solace in like the written word and in music and like shaping, like embracing community or perception or just home, you know? I mean, I know that there's like a lot of, yeah, sources of solace. Um, like there's a lot of stuff around Sherman Alexi. Um, I think rightfully so. Like there's been a lot of community, like conversation around him uh he's not unscathed I think and um so it got complicated but um the second semester I was in high school I went from going to school on the reservation in Arizona not um my tribe's reservation but um the 
White, Mount, White Mountain Apache Res, going to school there, moving 2000 miles away by myself to go to this private boarding school because essentially my family understood that like, if you stay here, you're probably gonna drop out of school and it's not gonna be a good, we just can't, you know? So like, um, and that is subsequently what happened with my three siblings. Um, you know, I'm a first generation student and my siblings didn't have the kind of structural or structural support or resources that they needed to finish high school under the like anticipated four year track. So I fly 2000 miles away and go to this boarding school in Wellesley, Mass, everyone. I'm just going to say that um, an all, bo all girls boarding school, um, completely different, like class culture, completely different geography, not a Saguaro in sight. <laughs> um, can, like completely different climate even, like the air is different, the skyline and the horizon is different. Um, and I picked up a, um, a Sherman Alexi book and reading through, I could hear like the voice of people that I had like no longer could see in my day-to-day -day life, you know? Um, and the same thing happened when a person, um, from the South who had worked actually with MLK um, came and spoke to us. Uh, it was like a big keynote speaker. Um, and just hearing someone who sounded like my family, someone whose voice and timbre and speed of, of diction, um, I, again, I cried because again, a very soft boy. <laughs> um, but moments like that. So even when I didn't have a like, in real time physical community. And it was a really lonely time. Um, I could find solace in like the art, um, some of which was handed down, you know, um, Zikala Sa, like narratives around um, going to a boarding school, like the genocidal boarding schools um, in the US that indigenous communities were really ransacked by a whole generation of people. Um, experienced these like traumatic institutions and reading her work about surviving um, boarding schools while being in a very different boarding school, but experiencing like that level of homesickness, loneliness and alienation, drawing those parallels and noting the differences was also really crucial. So, um, and I've been really lucky in the last couple of years to have had a further integration of my efforts and the community spaces that I really have been hungry for for years. I, you know, work with a number of folks who are TGD um, and a number of queer folks, the majority of my team, you know, I feel exceptionally lucky to be in that space now and to be able to have both this like expressive art community, you know, I still have the books on my shelves. Um, I still go back and read Stone Butch Blues on occasion and cry and think about how my life is different um, since Leslie's uh, writing. Um, and then I hop onto a Zoom call and I get to work with um, co-conspirators on making the kind of changes that hopefully mean that like people like me don't have to be as lonely as I was. Um, so. I hope again that that made any kind of sense. It made sense in my head, but. Totally, thank you. Um, it did, it did make sense. Um, and also I, I wanna say, um, I had to go back and um, uh, read a definition or find a definition of solace, uh, solace, mm. solace, how do you say that? You got it, solace, yeah. Okay, great, um, I'm English a second language. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a learning experience, every day it's a learning experience for me. Um, and solace means comfort or consolation in a time of distress and sadness, um, which sounds like 2020. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, in uh, Jer actually asked um, the group uh, that um, is here, like what are your um, sources of solace? Um, and this is one of them for me, um, is being able to paint another face, you know, and being able to show up. I don't want to say better, because I don't think one is better than the other. Um, I don't want to say prettier either, because I don't think one is prettier than the other. Uh, but a more judged up uh, version of myself uh, to the world. Um, and knowing that 
if there is uh, an opportunity of transformation within my face, that there is always an opportunity of transformation within my life. Um, so I also would like to um, encourage folks um, if they feel uh, safe and want to do so to share a little bit of uh, your sources of solace. Um, and this uh, goes into the other question that we had prepared is, um, how is resiliency resonating with you, um, Jack, going into 2021? Okay, I'm gonna put a little epilogue on the community conversation because, um, Go for it. you know, healing isn't linear. And when we're chatting, my conversations will not be linear also, so sorry. Um, but uh, I also wanted to add that um, I, sought out my family history um, when like really grasping for community, um, grounding myself, orienting myself in my um, in my like family system and especially as it relates to like being Bodewad me um, and what that meant, especially because I was feeling my nativeness anew. On the res I was the white kid at Dana, I was the native kid. Um, and so, uh, really grappling with that shift, um, led me to also engage in language reclamation work for Bode Wadmi Win, my tribal's like tribal language, um, and getting involved in distance learning around that, um, and actually had the ability to, um, look at some grant funding, um, through a program at school, um, to go and do language reclamation work with an elder of my tribe for a summer. And it was a time of like great traumatic upheaval for me to so like to be moving from a place of like grief and pain, um, carrying that and also uh, I, you know, I talked with Jared about this at length, but um, had the ability to uh, join them for a sweat and kind of um, start walking myself back to wellness and health um, coming from like really intense grief and loss and um, a lot of self-destructive um, things that were actually like fracturing my ability to be in community to um, literally living in the family's home um, and working with them. Um, and every word that I found and could contextualize and could train my mouth to make um, felt like another piece, felt like another um, little tiny tendril root down to where I needed to be. Um, and I unfortunately haven't had the ability to continue with that work to the extent that I would like, but like I still carry some of those words. And so the language um, and even just like having like baby's first bodewad me in my mind um, feels like I have a greater sense of community um, in that, you know, I can say um, when um, Boston and I on, you know, I can like, if nothing else, I can ground myself. I can tell you my name. I can tell you Nishnabe Ndao. I can tell you that I'm native. I can tell you that I'm Borewad Mean Ndao. But, um, you know, I can't talk about astrophysics, but, um, you know, I can tell you that like Borewad Me, we're the people of the fire. Ode is the, is the fire that we keep and it's the, the medicine. And so even, even those little baby tendrils, um, connected me and kept me walking, you know, because I, that, to go back to the idea of resilience and maybe breaching into the next question around like, what does 20, well, how does resiliency um, resonate in 2021? It's like, it's that ability to like keep on walking and um, to hold each other through that, not carry each other necessarily, but like hold each other, show up for each other um, and know what keeps us walking too, and know, like, acknowledge barriers in the path, like, acknowledge obstacles, have, like, empathy for the obstacles in other people's paths that you aren't walking, and, like, do what you can to alleviate those to the, or to, like, heal and sustain and, like, strengthen people through it, um, because I don't, I would like to see, like, a place where we're not talking about resiliency as much as we're talking about like enmeshment, you know, and like um, 
little root systems growing together, you know, we're stronger that way. And that's, that's a cliche, but I think it's there, you know, is um, that the individualistic, the like bootstraps view of emotional wellness is not, doesn't resonate. It does not work for me. And I, um, I don't know what my life would be like right now if I didn't share my home with an incredible partner who is um, really, really supportive and has helped keep me walking, even if it's just in circles around my house. Um, you know, so like find, find the new directions that like your little root systems can grow in and connect with each other. Cause I, you know, if we, I wrote the, I read this really cool book this year about, um, uh, systems in underground networks. And they talked about, um, uh, the mycelium that runs through the forest floor, the mushroom systems, fungal systems that connect trees, and they can connect trees of different species, actually. So this birch might be hanging out with this maple, um, and they can talk to each other and warn each other of, of threats. Um, and if a tree is injured, they'll actually, Star Trek Discovery went into that, amazing. Um, so cool. Uh, so, and if a tree is injured, they'll actually, the system will reroute nutrients to that injured, injured tree until that tree is no longer responsive and has died or has healed or fought off whatever infection or illness it had. So find yourself a little mushroom tangle and join it. <laughs> Cause I think that's how we get through this. I love that. It, it's like a mutual aid community, like, mm. um, and we have examples, I mean, our people who we are now rightfully so holding up as champions and leaders, um, like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, starting um, the st street action, right, street transvestite action revolutionaries, and literally like building a community for the next generation to keep going with Star Trek. <laughs> um, but what, I mean, re literally um, building a foundation and having a, a roof and a home um, that was paid for by survival sex work. Mm -hmm. And um, and a, I mean, and survival, lots of things um the getting through i mean doing what you have to do to to make that network that you're fine that you're i think articulating really well and i'm really excited to see um just i mean even the fact that we're doing this and stories of survival what we've we all insiders know and what everyone's gonna know um coming up just some of the really exciting ways that I think people all over the world, um, even just in Boston, we see it so many people like, uh, I mean, like Athena Vaughn and mm -hmm. Chastity Bowick and Treyandra Valentine and people who are um, Jennifer Love, <laughs> really building um, community and helping to be the advocates and mentors and guides and like be a big mushroom amongst like a bunch of little mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, and I think that like mutual aid um, isn't, I mean, it's not a new idea, you know, like it's like, I think that, um, you know, that kind of like has a, a ring of like, you know, new like, social activism um, in some ways, but it's honestly how so, so many of us have lived for so long. So I think it's a reclamation piece more so than it is like a, a revolutionary idea. It's coming back home, you know, and like taking care, of, taking care of your people, however you define that. And I hope that people define that expansively, you know, because like, um, yeah nurturing each other through this and through everything, you know, like I um, was reading a thing about uh, like communes and 
uh, like social experiments like that where people go off grid and go off and live together. Um, and it was talking about an aspect that I hadn't considered before where a commune is a closed off space that's holding the outside world at bay and becomes a space where people are pushing against whatever system or structure that they're working against. But the like ideal being that there's not an, out, an external structure to push against um, where like, um, yeah, mutual aid, mutual support and um, a, a sense of deep community isn't the exception or isn't something that needs to be gated off in a way that we see that sometimes these situations go really downhill because they become a microcosm of larger power inequalities and become a place where people are exploited. Whereas if something is not bounded, then, you know, it, it becomes just like the space of healing. Um, yeah, I feel you. And to, to talk about resilience a little bit more too, I think that like resilience becomes a place where uh, people can diffuse a little bit of the energy of resistance, you know, um, and the ugly side of survival, ugly side of survival. It's easier to look at someone's story of resi resilience and like that and take that as inspiration um, without again, seeing the places where things need to be resisted and changed um, or and also like to whom does resiliency stick? You know, I don't think that it sticks as strongly to people or is used as often to describe people that are pathologized based on race, based on gender, based on sexual orientation, you know, is I think that like you may have individuals that are really lauded and made like made heroes and because they're so strong, they got through it. But I think that that doesn't extend to a community writ large, you know, like I am not a black woman, but because of misogyny noir and trans misogyny noir, like I don't know that trans black women get the get lauded in the same way for surviving in systems that like would really prefer that they not, you know? So like if we're talking about resistance, I think we also have to talk about survival and we have to have to talk about systems that are working contrary to people's survival while we're naming them as like strong and resilient, you know? And do, do people's strength and like strategies and tactics of survival, whose, strate whose strategies of survival are criminalized? And I think that we trace that back to um, who, who we want to survive as a culture and who we don't. You know, if you're doing survival sex work, in most places that's criminalized you know if you're doing if you're using substances to survive you're most places that's criminalized um and that like pulls you in, into structures of destruction we're talking about the prison industrial complex um so um i just like to keep things light <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect oh my gosh this is so good yeah this got me thinking um, how important it is to create art that is able to um, challenge the uh, systems, mm. uh, challenge the ideologies uh, that have built those systems, uh, that challenge the individual perceptions that mm. uphold uh, those ideologies Mm -hmm. that create those systems. And um, of course, um, it got me thinking about Beyonce and how, right, of course. Um, and um, one thing, um, whenever, I, whenever I think about the work that she has done uh, for Black people uh, lately, mm -hmm it's really easy for me to think of this goddess, right? And um, I keep reminding myself, I don't know who said it. I don't know where I read it, but it stuck with me um, that uh, the two ways of dehumanizing someone is by oppressing them and idolizing them. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, um, the work that many artists, including Beyonce is doing, um, is a work of resilience and survival. And mm -hmm. is a work in which 
um, allows us, uh, well, I should use I statements because um, I'm talking for myself, uh, allows me as somebody who is not black to understand that, or not to understand, to approximate an understanding mm -hmm. of what it is um, to be black in America. Mm -hmm. And I see um, a lot of my fellow um, queer artists doing similar things. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, that also uh, reminds me that I have a responsibility mm -hmm. as an artist. If I am afforded a stage, uh, whether it's physical or virtual, um, that I have a responsibility to go beyond the glitz and glam mm. and to tell my story because my story is important and I know that uh, my story can have a huge impact um, mm -hmm. to people who are like me like I I didn't have somebody like me growing up mm. um, and I'm thinking like how incredible it is that maybe I'm offering that to somebody else, mm. but we can do that mm -hmm. in our day-to-day -day life. You don't have, like, we don't have to be artists to do that. Mm. Like, um, we, in a sense, I feel like we are all artists of our lives because mm. we all build it and we mm -hmm. shape it. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a, a tangent that my mind went. Well, I love it. And I, I think too that like, it's, you said beyond the glitz and glam, but I think that position in itself is so important because like by speaking that with and through the glitz and glam, I think that like, that's such an important work in a culture that trivializes like feminist or femininity, you know? And so standing in that and saying like, here's my truth and here, like, I'm going to level with you and like, let's get weird. Let's get deep um, in a way that is like an unapolo unapologetically beautiful, I think is so crucial. So I'm just like shower in love. I just think it's really important, you know, that it's not in spite of, and I don't want to define your experience, but just like so important. Femphobia is real. It is, <laughs> it is real. And I'm it is still real. single. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to, again, thank uh, uh, folks um, who are joining us on the Zoom uh, for being here with us and also remind folks that um, if you have any questions, you're able to put them in the chat. Um, and if you're watching us on the rewatch, thank you so much for watching us and making sure that you uh, follow us for more things like this. Um, great. I um, would like to make space for you, Jack, uh, to just share a little bit more around, um, I don't know if any of you um, see the show uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, and if you do, um, then you'll know that RuPaul loves to do this for the drama. But today I am doing this for uh, de-edification uh, and for you to share a little bit about if I were to um, if I were to hold up a photo of Jack um, you know when you were three five six eight um, what message uh, or what words would you leave Jack little baby Jack um, I was like, is this, is this for the crowd? Is this for me? I'm not getting not read on live Zoom. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a really great question. Um, so is, are these descriptive or are these like, I'm like sending a like time travel message back to them? It can be, well, I mean, right now it can be whatever you want. Um, mm -hmm. acknowledging right that, um, this is a um, yeah. This is this is a this is an experiment um, that beyond the drama uh, mm -hmm. when it's made in TV. I think it's really important as we, you know, the same. I, I feel like the same messages that or the message. <laughs> let me gather my words. 
um, if we are leaving a message for a younger generation, then we need mm -hmm. to be clear on what that message is. And um, what better way of uh, finding clarity on the message that we want to send than to say, you know, back when I was six, mm -hmm. you know, I wish I had that message. I wish somebody had said that to me. Um, or back when I was six, somebody said this to me and it mm -hmm. helped me push through. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Um, I think that I would say something along the lines of it's okay not to know, you know, and like, and like, so, uh, and keep walking. Um, I, uh, and again, I want people to like to take care of themselves as they need to, but um, I have had um, suicidal ideation since I was very young and was not, was pretty certain for a very long time that I was not long for this world for just no, no reason other than um, I just had that sense. Uh, well, undiagnosed depression would probably be the reason, but um, it was very hard for me to conceptualize that I would be an adult and might even be an adult for a couple of decades, um, uh, however many um, I'm gonna get in this world. And so like, it's okay not to know and keep walking are um, really are actually like things that I've, I've kept as kind of a mantra, like keep walking has been part of my survival story in part, like informed by the fact that, um, you know, as part of that, like, um, poverty, lack of access, things like oftentimes that was the only choice that we had. Um, and uh, so it's very maybe like cliche and, and simplistic, but um, my life is also, my identity has been one that's been really liminal and ambiguous um, forever, you know, and I don't know that it will ever really resolve. And um, embracing that liminality and both the euphoria and the vertigo of having an identity that refuses to settle down um, and embracing the like the elastic really amorphous like delightfully unresolved queer identity that I have like not knowing and learning to love the unknown um, Yes, La Mestiza, okay, and, and Zoldu out here. Um, love her so much, okay. Um, yeah, speaking to that, that like you're gonna walk, it might be through shadow and it might be through light and just like walking is the, walking is the reason, not, not where you're headed, um, but there's gonna be somewhere, you know? Um, so just trying to help them like understand that um, there is a version of you that it, that survives. Yep. You know. Thank you. Uh, Jer, is it okay if I um, send that question back to you? Sure. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm a mess. I cry all the time. Um, I'm not a mess. It's good to cry. <laughs> it's really good to cry. We actually, it's very normalized in my household. And it's like, we have our daily cries, not always together, but sometimes, I mean, usually not together, but we talk about them. It's funny, funny darkness. <laughs> oh, will you ask the question again? A year? Yes. I have a photo of Jer oh, when you yeah. are four, five, six, whatever. Drunk. Yeah, you got it. Oh my gosh. I mean, I would be like, hey, there's going to be this really great person. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be these awesome people, Jack and JP and Tris, and uh, they're going to, you need to listen to them because <laughs> all of you have really, I mean, gosh, I wish there was someone like you. I mean, like all of you, like Jack, like that was, and me, <laughs> I wish there was someone like me who <laughs> like saw yeah. 
and like was aware and like not just was aware but was like brave enough to intervene in some capacity and I think that that's something that we as um, like queer survivors are kind of told that we don't have we don't really have an ability to connect with god so how can we have the ability to connect with humanity and so the things that we do for life and for passion and for survival and for um like abundance are not viewed in the same light they're viewed as like not inspirational. Um, you mentioned JP at a meeting recently, um, ballrooms, and that liminal, um, great word, Jack, structure that is a structure and that is an authority and that has rules and regulations and that will care for youth and i mean we'll care for people of many i mean intergenerationally really um and we'll care for them by nurturing and you i mean holding people accountable so there are rules and they're not always spoken mm -hmm. they're learned and you learn in the house because if you learn outside you might not get a chance to learn from it you might it might be your last time so you learn in the house where you know you're gonna get maybe i mean you're gonna get reprimanded <laughs> you're, you're gonna get uh reading but it's gonna hurt your ego mm. more than it's gonna hurt your body and that's important because your body is your art and your life and your politics and your future and your community's future and that we have to use those bodies and we are using them um i think that's why i love drag so much mm. is that it is such a even with rupaul were like having changed what like or not changed but expanding the question of what is drag and um what is art and what is queer art in particular? Um, I mean, narrowing it down even further, what is like true, like queer survival art? Mm -hmm. um, we get to see all of these really neat expressions that now are being accepted as like, even if they're not always applauded i mean not everyone loves rupaul um fracking <laughs> uh, among i mean other you know the drama um that it's important i mean we all acknowledge that rupaul is a thing and that's power because that means that if rupaul's a thing we can then uplift that to critique it to build from there. RuPaul is not the end all. Drag Race is the beginning. <laughs> not even the beginning. It's a middle, it's a, like a weird middle child. And we're mm -hmm. gonna find that out in the future. It's, and it's that walking. I love that, Jack, the walking, because it's in the walking or in the moving forward, however you move in the world mm -hmm. that gets you to that future that is like really the queer that i mean i'm not the first one to say this but like the queer like that utopia that we're always hoping for that we know will be there one day even if i don't see it or we don't see it like we will be a part of that utopia for the people who it is a sanctuary for thank you thank you Thank you. Um, we have a couple more minutes, and I know that this uh, wasn't specifically a uh, uh, community conversation. This was more of a 
uh, interview slash uh, a conversation with Jack. Um, however, I think that there is a lot of power in sharing. Um, so I would want to open up to folks who are here with us. Um, if you would like to share with the group and um, and if you would like to share with people watching on the rewatch. Um, however, if you do not want your sharing to be included in the rewatch, just say at the beginning of your share, say just for the group and we'll cut that out with the magic of editing. Um, but um, I wanna open up to the group, um, what message of resilience and uh, survival and um, yeah, what message would you, would you have, would you want to send to that younger you? Not all at once. Let's think about it as well, because um, you don't have also to share it with the group. Um, this is something that you can keep to yourself. And you can share in the circles that uh, feel um, the most appropriate and the best for you. Sometimes that circle is oneself, and that's also perfectly fine. I really, this is Kay. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, Kay. I really resonated with what Jack, with what you shared about keeping walking and also being comfortable with not knowing. I think that mm -hmm. my younger self, especially like sort of after I hit age 11, mm -hmm. I started wondering, wait, it seems like people are telling me there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel wrong, but other things feel wrong. And I don't, I don't know quite how to cope with all of that. And, um, you know, pre-internet and pre-people being in the media, queer folks in the media, I was like, I have no words. I have zero language to define this. And I think um, I, it also makes me think about your comments earlier about how language itself can have this immense power both to heal and mm -hmm. also to be the way that you continue to walk. And Honestly, I feel like I would go to my six-year-old self and I would be like, I have some education, I have some words. I've got some mm -hmm. stuff for you. It's like in a package and we're just gonna go through and you're gonna be like, I feel this way. And I'm gonna be like, that makes sense because X or you know, how do I tell somebody about how I feel and what I need? And it's like, oh, use these words um, and find this professional because even when I was young there were there were people who could have helped me and maybe it would have been really hard to get to them I don't know but it would have been soothing to know the words it would have been helpful to be able to tell people with clear definitions so that I wasn't casting about so widely I felt very much um I felt it felt very much like a Plato's cave sort of a situation mm -hmm. um in terms of having to go through the struggle of turning towards the light and deciding, okay, I'm gonna walk towards that. I have no idea what it is. And um, to ease that transition and kind of building again on this idea of, is that suffering necessary for us to go through to have full actualized identities and important presences in the world? And that's what I'd give to my younger self anyway. Thank you, Kai. Andrew, go for it. Yeah, this is Andrew. Um, yeah, I think probably, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about going back to um, what was what was said earlier about um, the idea of like, like different different things that we get through difficult situations with and like, you know, certain kinds of um, coping being like more legitimate. I think I would probably like tell my younger self that it's okay to be angry and it's okay to say no. Um, because I think, you know, I think a lot of times, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think you can really speak your truth. I don't think you can really 
claim part of yourself if you're not also if it's not also if you're not also allowed to have boundaries um you know and, and i think kids in particular and um you know i think you know especially kids from like you know multiple marginalized identities are kind of taught that they don't they don't really have autonomy they don't really have a right to their own bodies their own selves um you know their their own ways of speaking and, and i think for a lot of people in the queer community that's especially the case you know that that um you know, or, or, you know, that, that question that you, people hear a lot when they come out is like, well, what, what, about, what about your parents? What do they think about this? And like, you know, like, I don't think, um, I think when people are taught that, that, you know, they have to care so much about what everyone else is, is how, how everyone else is feeling that they, they you know, you, you can't really make room for your own feelings. Um, you know, and I, I think, I think it's important that, um, that young people be able to to understand like, you know, there, there are times when you, there are times when you, you get to not care like how other people are reacting or how they feel about who you are or what your choice is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and I think there's something there about um, packaging your experience for others too, or like the narratives around one's experience, especially if we're talking about like resiliency in a way that's kind of like, buffing off the like the sharp edges um that it becomes like consumable by others um especially maybe folks that don't have experienced that or don't have those shared marginalized identities that it's like I can feel okay about transphobia because I know this person who is really well adjusted um you know uh so I think that like boundaries and also like whose story is it and is there room for the the messier like less palatable parts of survival or um like uh reactions to trauma uh you know like you know anger rage like grief all of those things that people don't want to see and are pathologized in like western society especially western medicine um how do we like see people's rage? How do we see people's grief? And then also like, how do we stand in our ability to feel rage or grief or the unpleasant aspects of this, of the healing process and not feel compelled or forced or coerced to making that palatable to others? How do you grieve messy? Like, how do you rage? How do you like resist as an act of survival? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Andrew, to just run with what you said. I was just like, ah, you're saying such good stuff. Desire, yes, Jer, sorry. That's, I mean, that's what I was gonna say is I desire. I think that mm -hmm. I used to, I feel like I've gone through these really great, <laughs> like painful, um, phases of my life where I can be like oh yeah this is I was like bad feminist like angry ragey like mm -hmm. moments and um I'm glad I can kind of <laughs> put those back mm -hmm. and draw on them from time to time when I need them because I really have evolved into looking at like the power of desire and mm -hmm. um I mean Theologically, even, I think about for myself that if humanity is this like incarnate embodiment of the divine that isn't desire and like the veneration of bodies, the worshiping mm -hmm. of bodies, like very very literally and figuratively um isn't that like true like prayer or mm. true devotional or i mean creating life we I, I think think about creating life as a very heterosexual or heteronormative thing that cis gender um, women and cisgender men have the ability to create and um, because that ability is so visible and is 
what our society is wrapped around mm -hmm. is the nuclear family um, that we have not been able to see the to be cheesy like the queer art of resilience as um anything beyond like a a niche specialty like you can go on i don't even know what channel it is and get or what app it is to get rupaul like you can go you can pay the extra money to watch this um it's available in this niche way when it's um it's not it's not a niche thing our experiences are not niche they're not um you know circus oddities uh, they can be if we want them to be <laughs> if that's the path we choose and there's beautiful clowns um so power to them but that it's about uh that our experiences of the world are just as real and valid and mm. um we create so much i mean i think that's what people are afraid of mm -hmm. inherently and maybe even don't know it is that like queer people of color are the most creative people in the world and their creation and their capacity to create is so much like aligned with survival and it's tragic and horrific and beautiful and i can relate in where varying ways race not being one of them um i am very white and i so it's it's just I, i'm we need to to be able to hold these we say like black lives matter like what does that mean what that means is that life that 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 person's experience that person's reality and how they perceived the world and how they changed the world is and continues to be real it was and is and that it it doesn't need to change the systems that are trying to bar that potential for creation because it's not even like the life is lived it's cut short violently oftentimes and that's terrible um but it's lived still and that is i mean we just forget that i forget that even like i have to remember that like little things or things that seem little in my life um are really not that little that they are they make up my life they so so if i can't be who I want to be. If I'm too afraid to wear nail polish when I'm walking the dog, then that's, and I want to wear nail polish, <laughs> then that's a problem. And I need to confront that. And not everyone has that privilege, that strength in that, because that strength is hard. I mean, everyone has the strength in them. I want that to be clear everyone finds it at different times. I'm 31 and I, my life has been like 30 years of hell, 31, 30.4 years of hell. <laughs> um, and, you know, I managed to survive and somehow now I, I think that's, and it's reading. I love reading for that reason. You, it's like, you learn to fight in different ways and it's um that's what going through these experiences for me at least has done is that i've had to learn these creative and alternative ways they're not mainstream 
and I piss a lot of people off. Um, and in doing so, I make I I make something that is so queer survival esque um, that I just am so proud of myself, and I'm really glad that uh, I'm rambling. I'm, I like what you. Yeah. Sarah, I loved what you said about desire and like, I think pushing that forward and desire in in, in action, um, talking about pleasure and what pleasure to, what role does pleasure play in, um, in queer resistance, resilience, survival, like a whole host of things. Um, and like, how do we get to stand in our desire and stand in our pleasure as well? Because I think that like, it's not just the deficits, it's the strengths, you know? And for me, like queer desire, queer pleasure is so like crucial um, and so, um, um, so counter to a world that like is hell bent on destruction, you know? Um, so I'm really excited to read the, um, the Activism of Pleasure, I think is what the book is called. It's on my reading list um, to try to delve into that a little bit more because I think embracing that um, and like taking pleasure in our bodies and our partners and our communities and our lives and our expressions, like it's, that's pleasure activism. Yeah, thank you, Tris. Um, it's all real. It's all so, so real. I love it. Thank you. And thank you everybody um, for engaging in this conversation and for sharing uh, into this impromptu uh, share circle. Um, we have a couple more minutes. I just want to make space if anybody else would like to share um, anything before we wrap up. Yeah, thank y'all for bearing witness. Uh. Six, five, four, three, two, one, let's go. Level up. Level up, okay. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, Jack. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Muchisimas, muchisimas gracias. Thank you for being here and for sharing so much of yourself um, and for opening it up like uh, the beautiful book that you embodied today. Um, <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, any last words? No oh, last that's... words. <laughs> You know what I mean, but um, any- You'll never catch me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank awesome. you all so much. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, my name is Just JP, as you all likely know me already. Uh, I, um, I am on all social media at uh, Drag Queen JP, as I shared at the beginning. My name is JP and I am a drag queen. Super easy to remember. All my social media, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Venmo. Uh, the only one different is Cash App, where it's JP Drag Queen, because for, for some reason I couldn't get the other one. Um, and if you haven't had enough of me, um, I will be doing a Christmas Eve show. Um, it's a Mariah Carey themed digital drag show uh, on the Serve Network, uh, which is on Twitch twitch.tv slash the serve network. And uh, we will be uh, going live at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we will be celebrating uh, the queen of Christmas herself, Mariah Carey. Uh, we have 12 amazing performances by incredible artists. We have um, local burlesque legend, Johnny Blazes doing All I Want In My Ass Is You. So you cannot miss that incredible uh, parody. Um, so yeah, you can see me there. Um, I also have a YouTube channel in which I am putting all of my digital track performances. I have about 25 of them. So I am uploading them slowly but surely every Friday. And this Friday, uh, I am uploading the music video for my original song, Go Ahead. Uh, so you can catch that there as well. Um, again, my Venmo is at DragQueenJP. Um, and uh, once again, thank you everybody uh, who has joined us today. And thank you everybody who is watching this on the rewatch. If and you want, what was that? And our sponsors, sorry. 
and our sponsors. Oh, good. Thank you for reminding me because yeah. I would have completely forgotten. Uh, okay. Jerry, would, you, would you like to shout out our sponsors? Just really quick. Thank you. I'm so sorry, JP. Um, HMM, thank you so much. BU uh, Innovation Lab, you rock. And then there's been just like lots of great community support. Even tonight, some of you paid for this. Like, thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody. So this, a nonprofit. So but. this is the end. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for uh, watching, for tuning in. And I hope you have lots of uh, blessings and love. Bye. All right. So here.